Well, since your tears make me stronger, I would say yes. However, I'm not doing it just to, to, just to cause you pain. Uh, hopefully there's a lot of joy and humor in the, the book as well. And so far, one of my favorite things about the Red Rising series is the camaraderie, the family element amongst the, 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 the group from the original trilogy. And so there's a lot of lovely tears as well, hopefully. <laughs> Not just tears of pain. Gods know. People, people who are extremely powerful end up in tables, you know, as kitchen adornments or, you know, uh, in my world. So I think it'd be kind of devastating in a way. And either you either, you either have to give up, you know, get in touch with your mortality or give up your morality and both would be very difficult. However, if I could, you know, not notice the social inequalities around me, it might be kind of good to be a silver and to have grab boots and fly because you can be like, I want to fly up that mountain right there. And it's like the most awesome form of hella skiing, except you only need grab boots. It'd be so cool. Like imagine that. Or you say you, you want to go out to that island and you just fly out to that island and there's like little dragons in the sea. Kind of, it might be awesome. I'm just saying, I mean, they have dragons and chimera and griffins you can fly on, so it might be a lot of... Yes, I would. It would be great. <laughs> Probably silver. The problem is then I'd be doing banking and stuff like that, and that's, you know, sounds a little bit terrible. It sounds like a dystopia in its own way for me. I was almost a banker, and so I, I, I interned for a bank for a little while, and I detested it. So... You know, silver maybe, but then everyone else would be kind of subjugated. It'd be kind of terrible to be violent because then you have to do acid when you're 11 years old. And frankly, that sounds like a very threatening proposition. Well, I don't want to give anything away, but if they're a POV narrator now, obviously they'll have a voice in the next book. But I want to leave it open to be able to explore more voices. And you know, following the, as the story continues to unfold and expand, it wouldn't do the book or the story justice if I didn't follow new characters as well. So I think whatever fits inside the framework I'm creating. <laughs> I'm saying yes, but leaving myself room to wiggle out of it. Surprisingly, Lyria. See, I thought she'd be the most difficult because, you know, obviously I never have been a 16-year-old girl, and I thought that channeling that voice would be very difficult because she had so many different experiences for me. But then I realized I had very few similar experiences as a warlord from Mars. So finding her voice was simply a matter of finding, for me, the right song for her. They kind of found her tone. Cause I still think music is the best way to capture a soul better than any other form of art. So as soon as I found that, I found her tone. Her voice started singing off the page. And she became my favorite, mostly because she's the inverse of all the other characters. These are war gods. These are very powerful people. These are you know, absurdly violent individuals in a world that treasures violence in a way for an agent of change. And she is someone who is the weakest person physically on the page, yet that underdog voice, that resilience makes her spirit somewhat indomitable, and I can't wait to see where she goes. <laughs> well, Hans Zimmer. No, uh, gosh, who did remember? The, no, who did uh, Last Mohicans? Trevor Jones is fantastic. He'd be good, um, but probably Bear McCreary. Bear McCreary is actually randomly a friend of mine in L.A. and he did. I, I met him on a plane, and he did uh, Battlestar Galactica music. But I didn't. I knew knew the because I, I was a huge fan of Battlestar Galactica. But I didn't know who Bear McCreary was really. I knew the name. So I'm sitting on a plane. And there's this guy reading Nightfall, the Batman comic, and I was like, oh, that's one of my favorite panels right there. And then we start talking a little bit, and I think I asked what he did or something like that. And his wife says that or he says he's a musician. His wife says he's a composer of TV shows. And I'm like, okay, what shows? And he's like, oh, you probably haven't heard of him. And his wife says Battlestar Galactica. I'm like. <gasps> And I just did, you're Bear McCreary? And he's like, you know who I am? Yes! So I fanboyed a little bit. And then we, then I've made him get lunch with me a couple times. And uh, he's gone on to do Outlander, he, what, The Black Sails, Walking Dead, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., tons of TV shows. Did J.J. Abrams movie Cloverfield Lane and is doing a lot of other programs. So I mean, he's amazing because he brings this eclectic sound in. And Red Rising is nothing if not diverse. So some of the music that he brought into Battlestar Galactica, the Indian influences, w w along with kind of the old school uh, 1960s rock, bringing all that. Well, I wouldn't want you know Jimi Hendrix necessarily in Red Rising, but I think the eclectic spirit that he brings to it would really benefit the project. 
Yes, but I'm thinking more small screen than big screen now. So originally it was big screen, but small screen is much more interesting to me. One, because the ballooning budgets, which is lovely because it gives you more ammunition to tell your story. And two, the long form narrative gives you the opportunity to explore things you didn't see in the book. And the reason I wrote Iron Gold is because I'm not done with this world. I want to continue to explore it. And in TV form, you'd be able to see more. Instead of truncating things, you'd be able to see the POVs almost of beloved characters like Pax and Tactus and Mustang and really get into their stories. And I think that it would lend more um, representation to the world and the story and it would paint a larger palette than a movie would. No truncation, you know. So I, I try to write early in the morning as I can, because I think that when you're Tabi La Rasa, with that blank slate in the morning, it's when you write best. Because as Freud put it, you have your id, you have your subconscious, you have your conscious. Your conscious mind is the one that, whenever you check your cell phone, you're brought back into it, and people check their cell phone on average of five or eight minutes a day in the Western world. So you're checking yourself, and you're all of a sudden brought back to the conscious mind. Or if you're thinking about your emails, if you're thinking about your daily stress, your bills to pay, your credit card bill that's due, your insurance you haven't paid, taking your dog for a walk, that kind of stuff brings you to your conscious mind. And that interrupts the writing because then you become self-critical. So what I try to do is work write early in the morning so that I don't have that. And I write from about seven to about maybe two, and then I take a break and maybe they'll come back later in the day. But that time period of waking up and there's working solid, and my girlfriend would yell, do you want brekkie? And I'm just like, what? And she's trying to be so sweet. Do you want coffee? I'm like, no. Yes, that sounds lovely. <laughs> so she, you know, bring me coffee. Like, you have to come down to get it. I'm like, Ugh. so I, like slump downstairs in my bathrobe <laughs> and then go back up like a curmudgeon. But I write, you know, trying to have uh, a blank slate as much as I can in order to be able to tap into that subconscious and really, you know, when you're studying and you uh, or reading a book and then all of a sudden it's two hours later and you're like, you have a crick in your neck. That's what I'm trying to tap into because that's when you really start flowing. You're not self-critical. And I find that that's easier to do in the mornings. At nighttime, I just don't have the diligence and I'd rather watch Blade Runner, you know.